Hey everybody, I uh, wanted to take this opportunity to go over the uh, review worksheet. Like the answers are already available on Canvas, but I figured I would talk through them because sometimes it's easier to, to listen to somebody than it is to read. And sometimes doing both will help you understand better. So here we go. Let me go over to the worksheet. So oh, as you can see, I've been, I've been scrolling through this a little bit already. So there we go. Um, so this first question is about normal distributions and just how they work. Just your, your basic, can you use normal CDF? So one thing you wanna remember for the test, you absolutely have to know what this means. I have students, I always have students who, who wonder what, what this notation is. And uh, yeah, that, that doesn't work, you gotta know this. Um, so yeah, so here X is a random variable. Uh, it's normally distributed with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. And so if we want to find the probability that X is less than 400, we would just normal CDF that up. Now it's probably, um, I'll, I'll just do it once, but you can, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how you could probably do this without actually using any math or without actually using your calculator. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go to the calculator here that guy. So we had a mean of 500, standard deviation of 100. We want 400 or less. I guess I should actually, uh, I should really do this if I'm, if I'm uh, being good about this. Uh, I really want to do uh, this, right? I want to draw this. This is uh, yeah, my normal distribution. I made it too, uh, too low. So this is, this is N 500, 100. The reason I specifically chose 500, 100, by the way, is it is ostensibly the distribution of each section on the SAT. Anyway, uh, 400 or less. So this is 500 here. So 400 is over here somewhere, like there. 400 and or less would be that area. So I'm going to do normal CDF of minus infinity up to 400. And uh, yeah. Uh, with a mean of 500 and standard deviation of 100. So let's uh, go, whoop, there we go, uh, calculator. So I wanna go to normal CDF, that's second of ours, uh, normal CDF, Cal calculator. Oh, it's a number lock, I turned off somehow. Uh, lower, lower bound of minus infinity, upper bound of 400, standard mean of 500, standard deviation 100, and there we go, 0.1586 or about 16% or so. So let me uh, very briefly talk about how you could do this without uh, doing hardly any math at all, without even using your calculator and, and get very close to the right answer. So you might remember the empirical rule. The empirical rule tells us that within one standard deviation of the mean, there is 68% of the data. So here I'm gonna, I'm gonna clear all this off, draw another normal distribution. Within one standard deviation of the mean, right, so here's mu, this is mu plus one sigma and mu minus sigma. Oh, that's not a very good sigma, let me undo that. Let me try that again, mu minus sigma. And it tells us that there's 68% in here, 68% in here. Um, and so that means that there's 32% not in here, right? So there's 32% on the outside. And if you divide that 32% into two halves, you get 16% on each side. So 16% here and 16% here. Well, if you just look at the, uh, if you just look at this problem, you can see that we went exactly one standard deviation to the left, right? One a standard deviation is, is 100 units. We went one to the left, so to the left of that was 16% or 15.86%. But uh, yeah, should have a pretty good handle on that if you remember the empirical rule. Or if you don't remember the empirical rule, I'm not gonna have my feelings hurt. You can do that just fine and it'll be okay. Um, and you just use your calculator for everything. Anyway. Part B here, uh, the, the reason I asked this question, the difference between X less than 400 and X less than or equal to 400 is that I want to remind you that in a continuous distribution, those probabilities are the same. They don't actually have the same meaning, right? One, you know, 400 would count in here, but not in there, but the probability of being exactly equal to 400 is zero if you do the math because it has no width because again, probabilities area. So there we go. Uh, that's uh, what's the difference between this question? 
the the meaning of it like less than or equal to does mean something different than less than but probability wise they're they're entirely the same it's not this that's not true for discrete distribution right remember that that the less than versus less than or equal to matters in discrete but not in continuous all right x greater than 550 we're going to do normal cdf of 550 to infinity uh in fact I'll, I'll just go ahead and let you do that on your own uh let's see what the where's the answers there they are right i even show you what uh what command you can use here 550 to infinity with a uh, mean of 500 standard deviation of 100 is about 30 percent and same thing here all right since you can see the answers i kind of want to just uh, or since you can see the answers on the, on the answer sheet, I kind of want to just talk about these uh, and, and instead of going through them all uh, in, in great detail. So uh, answer, how would you have known the, the answer to the previous problem with minimal effort? Well, if you notice, we the mean is 500, and this is 300 is 200 below that, and 700 is 200 above it. So we went two standard deviations on either side. So about 95% of the data is within. So it's actually slightly larger than 95%, but empirical rule tells us within two standard deviations to get 95% of the data. Quartiles and IQR to find the quartiles. Uh, so you, if you wanna find Q1 and Q3, of course, Q2 is the median. And that's the, in, this, in, in any symmetric distribution, but particularly in normal distributions, uh, that's equal to the mean. So you don't really have to have to do any uh, calculator punching for that one. Um, but you wanted to use inverse norm of 25% and inverse norm of 75% to find the quartiles, the, the uh, 25th and 75th percentile. 60% um, of the values of the distribution of X are at least how large? So I asked this question because this, this is not actually all that different from the previous part. This is just purely hard to interpret, right? When you read this, it's a little bit confusing. So 60% of the values in the distribution of X are at least how large? So in other words, what is the lower bound for 60% of the values, right? Because I'm asking about where on the distribution can I find all the, the X's that are at least as big as something? Well, that means that the X's have to be bigger, greater than or equal to the something. So that means that we are looking, we are thinking about something like, uh, well, let's, uh, let's clear that off. Something like this, right? You get your normal distribution. And so if I have 60% are at least as big as something, the only real question is, am I talking about like 40 on the left and 60 on the right or 60 on the left, 40 on the right? And it's it's the first one. And the reason it's the first one is the X's are at least as big as this value, right? So an X over here, there's an X. That is at least as big as this. It's bigger, but it's at least as big, right? So I'm talking, so when I say 60% of the X's are at least as big as this number, well, the, this is the number that I'm looking for, looking for here. So I should do inverse norm of 40%, right? Because there's 60% here and there's 40% over here. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'm looking for there. So do inverse norm of 40 and you get uh, something inverse norm of 0.4. I, I guess I should do an inverse norm just to remind everybody how that goes. So I want to go second bars. Inverse norm is number three. And that, hello, there it goes. Uh, area is, I, I want the area to the left. Now, again, if you have this um, switching option, you can use it. I'm not going to because most people don't have it. Most people are just stuck on left all the time. And in fact, don't even get this tail option, right? You just, you just see the, the, area mu sigma and paste and that's it um and so i'm just gonna leave mine on left because that's the things i do is what you what you would do if you don't have that option so i want to do uh 40 percent for the area uh mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100 let me go to paste that there we go 474.67 or thereabouts which is what you can see on the uh, on the answer key of course uh, okay then we want to find the Z scores of these things. I asked a bunch just to get you practice with Z scores. I deliberately asked questions that you could definitely do in your head if you remember what a Z score is, which is really what I want you to remember. Like the, the formula of X minus mu over sigma is, you know, it's great. Uh, it's a good to remember the formula, but that's a thing that you could look up. The, the 
idea of what is a Z score is something that you would kind of have to internalize. You could probably go poking around a book for it, but if you just like if you Google skirt and Google search Z score, the thing that you're going to get is the formula. Like that's the first thing that's going to come up. It's going to be the easiest thing to find. Trying to remember what it means though is a thing that you can internalize and really learn, which is what I'm of course going for in I mean it's it's a class, right? I want you to learn. So here's the thing I'm going to see. This 400 is one standard deviation below the mean. So it's z score is negative one. X equals zero is five standard deviations below the mean. So its standard deviation is negative five. 500, that is the mean. It is zero standard deviations away from the mean. So its standard, so its uh, z score is zero. X equals 1000, z score of five, z score of negative 0.5, z score of positive 0.5, and a z score of three. Right? I'll, uh, I'm sure I, I must have said on the uh, on the answers how I got those things. No, not really, <laughs> not really. But well, all I'm doing is I'm checking to see how many hundreds away from the mean. <coughs> oh, excuse me. How many hundreds away from the mean each of these values is? That's that's what I'm doing. <coughs> ah, if I want to find the x values that bound the middle eighty percent of the values of, uh, of x, well. I'm going to go draw a picture. Of course I am. Uh, I'll go ahead and clear those off. And we will draw a normal distribution. The middle, that is a pretty shady normal distribution. Um, middle 80% looks like this, right? It's the 80% in the middle. And so the question is then, how do you find these values? Well, I have, I, I want to use inverse norm, of course, because I'm looking for X values here. Um, and so I have to ask myself, well, how much area is on the outsides? And there's there's 80% in the middle, so there must be 20% on the outsides. If I split that 20% into two halves, I get 10% on either side. 10% here and 10% here. And so all I have to do is uh, inverse norm of 0.1 and then inverse norm of 0.9. So inverse norm of 0.1 here, of course, because that's the area to the left of this thing is 0.1. Then the area to the left of this is 0.9, right? There's the 80% here and then 10 more percent there is 90%. So inverse norm of 0.1, inverse norm of 0.9. That's how you find these. All right, back to uh, so go look at chapter seven. All right, so central limit theorem, the most important theorem in all of statistics. So the thing you really want to remember about the central limit theorem is one, the formula, and uh, two, what the requirements are. So for the central limit theorem for uh, means, there, there are two requirements, only one of which has to be met. Either the, we know the population is normally distributed or we have a sample size of at least 30. And in that case, then we can say that the sampling distribution of X bar is a normal distribution with a mean of the same mean as the, as the population and a standard deviation that is uh, smaller by a factor of root N. So sigma over root n. Right. Uh, okay, so here's what we got. Uh, stats class has 800 students. Average score on the first midterm is 75% with standard deviation of 20%. Distribution is bimodal and skewed to the left. Okay, so bimodal is not, uh, means that it is not normal, is not a normal distribution also. Skewed to the left, also not normal. Uh, so we don't have that. So without reading any further, I know that if my sample size is less than 30, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be able to use the central limit theorem here, right? Because I, I failed to meet the po normal population requirements. So that means that I need to have a sample size of at least 30 in order to use the central limit theorem. Let X be the score of one student. Okay. So it's not possible to find the probability that a single randomly selected student scored over 80%. Why is that not possible? And what information would I need to supply? So I would need to tell you what the distribution was. Uh, for you to, to know what this is, right? I specifically told you that the distribution is not normal. Well, I didn't say not normal, but the distribution is bimodal and skewed to the left, but I didn't tell you what it was, right? There's lots of ways you could be bimodal and skewed to the left or, yeah, there, there's lot, there's an infinite number of distributions that fit this description. These are just descriptive. This is not, not any sort of technical language. So the information I would need to supply is I would need to tell you the distribution. Uh, find the sampling distribution of X bar for N equals 40. All right, well, I know that I am going to, well, let's go back to uh, Y bar. 
right board here, uh, clear all this off. So for n equals 40, I'm going to be able to say that x bar is approximately normally distributed with a mean of the same mean, which was 75%, uh, 75%, and a standard deviation of um, the same standard deviation, which was 20%, uh, 20%, 20%, shrunk by the uh, square root of the sample size. Right, so all we have to do is just jam that in the calculator, right? 75 comma 20 over 0.4. That's how you do that. Um, let's go quickly look at what that is. Right, see, there I did it. I, I used uh, 0.75 and 0.2 instead of 75%, 20%, but they're the same. Those are the same thing. By the probability, the average score of 40 random students from this class is at least 80%. Well, the average score of 40 random students, the distribution of the all possible average scores of 40 random students is that thing that we just found. It's, it's uh, this distribution right here. So I just use this in my calculation, right? So here's my, my distribution, looks like this, mean uh, 75%. There's 80%, and I just find this area. So we do normal CDF of 80 or 0.8, and I'm sure is what I did on the on the answers. Uh, 0.8 and up, so 0.8 to infinity with a mean of 75% and a standard deviation of whatever that was, like 8% or something. Right, and so that's uh, that's where I'm getting this one, 0.8 to infinity with a mean of 75% and a standard deviation of that thing we found in the previous part. And you get about uh, 6%, five and a half percent, something like that. Um, same thing uh, going the other way, less than 60%. Um, now we're notice that this is much, much smaller. And the reason it's much smaller is that 80% here is only 5% above the mean, but 60% is 15% below the mean. And so the area smaller than that is, is very, very small, right? Um, notice that this is about 3% is one standard deviation thereabouts, it's like 3.16%. Um, so this 5% above the mean is like 1.6 standard deviations. It's one and two thirds standard deviations. Whereas this one that is 15% below the mean is five standard deviations away from the mean. So it's, it's gonna be much smaller. That's it. That's, uh, that's why it's so much smaller. All right. Uh, find the probability that the average score of 40 random students from this class differs from the population mean score by at least 10%. So that differs from is really telling you um, is away from, right? So both sides. You're going to have to, gonna have to count both sides. So if I uh, go back to the whiteboard to draw a picture here. It's going to look not uh, not exactly like this. I'll just uh, you know I'm gonna grab all this stuff here, and get rid of that, and draw a new picture. Which is I don't know why they make you click off a whiteboard and click back on it, but that's that's how you get the pencil back. There's no no other option. So um, here we go. Differs from the mean by at least ten percent means all right. So here's the mean seventy five. So differing from the mean by ten percent means eighty five or more or 65 or less, right? So all this stuff and all this stuff. So we just do, uh, since this is symmetrical, we can just find one of them and double it. So I would do two times normal CDF of, of one of these, either 85 to infinity or minus infinity of 65. And by the way, it would be totally fine to leave this at zero if you wanted to. Um, or to have a, a zero be your your lower bound because of course that's the lowest score you could actually get on a uh, on an exam, um, and so um, yeah, leaving it at zero will be fine. Notice that that's like twenty five standard deviations away from the mean, so there's there's basically no area out there. So the difference between using minus infinity and using zero is not going to be detectable by your calculator. Right? It'll it'll give me more than 10 places, more than 10 decimal places of, 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 you would require more than 10 decimal places of accuracy to detect it and your calculator only displays up to 10 decimal places. 
So uh, I would want to find those two areas, and presumably I have done that. So I, I guess maybe maybe I should do one of those on the calculator just to kind of show you how that goes, right? So the way I'm going to do that is uh, two times the standard, two times uh, normal CDF, right? And so you can put in stuff before you type this in. Um, so it's already set up for a lower bound of negative infinity, upper bound of uh, what we said, 65, uh, the mean of 75, and the standard deviation of, I forgot, I forgot 3.16? I'm just going to do this 20 over uh, the square root of 40. Whoop, hello, hang on. Square root, there we go, 40. Right, because that's, uh, that's, that's what it was originally calculated as. And so I end up with that. Notice it's really small because um, 10, 10 percentage points is about three standard deviations, right? So this is basically asking for the area outside of three standard deviations from the mean, which we know from the empirical rule is going to be really small, right? It, uh, it's a, like 0.0 or it's like 0.3 percent. Now, the reason this is smaller is because this is actually slightly more than three standard deviations, right? Three standard deviations is actually 9.48 percent and we went 10 percent, so it's a little bit smaller than 0.3 uh, percent, but right, right in that range. All right, so uh, in all possible samples of 40 students, 70% of the sample means are smaller than K, find K. So 70% of the sample means in all possible samples of 40 students. So the, the reason I phrased it this way is, I want you to notice that this is what it, what it means to be the sampling distribution, right? The all possible means is the distribution of um, sample means. Right, that, that's what the sampling distribution is. That's what the central limit theorem is telling us. So really what this is saying is using that sampling distribution that you found, 70% of the sample means are smaller than some number, find the number. Okay, well, let's draw a picture, see what we're gonna be doing. So this is, a, I might as well get rid of this again. I wish it was a little bit easier to erase stuff, but you know, erase precisely, I guess. I. I I guess I'm just griping about missing pencils. <laughs> okay, so pens. Anyway, um, so same distribution, right? It's it's still it's still this guy right here. Um, seventy percent being seventy percent of the means being smaller than something means that something must be over here, right? So this is seventy percent here, and so we just do inverse norm of 0.7 in this distribution, and we get whatever that right? we get that. This upper bound and what that whatever that number is is our answer. Uh, where's the pencil? There's the answers. So that turns out to be notice I, that's what I did. Inverse norm of 0.7 with the, this distribution, 76.7% is about the the score that 70% of the averages will be less than. All right. Professor took a sample of 80 students instead of 40 students. How would that change the sampling distribution of x bar? Well, we are doubling the sampling size and or the, the sample size. And the only the only role the sample size plays in the distribution of the sampling or in the sampling distribution is how much it shrinks the standard deviation. Well, more sample size means smaller standard deviation. This one would be smaller by a factor of root two, right? Because we're we're doubling the doubling n. So there would be the denominator would be. The square root of 80 instead of the square root of 40 and that's if you're good with your square roots you know that that's that's just root 40 times root 2 is root 80. you don't have to know that part i really just want you to notice that it's smaller um if the professor took a sample of 10 students instead of 40 would it be acceptable to use the clt no absolutely not we just talked about that at the very beginning right um you need a sample size of at least 30 in this case because we have a non-normal population so we can't use the CLT unless we take a big enough sample size and 10 is not big enough. All right, so Lauren, our favorite biologist, I, I, I don't know if you guys have picked up on this, but I, uh, I tend to name my, uh, name my, the people in my problems the same thing as because they're all named after real people. Um, this is uh, one of the former tutors in the math lab who just happens to know a lot about biology because she was a biology major. Um, yeah, so that's why my, my biologists are all named Lauren and Jason. Jason's my brother, who was a he's a bio major in college. Um, 
anyway, so here, here, what we've got here is uh, Lauren is doing some deep sea diving and she captured, she gets some crabs uh, that she thinks that she, that are unidentified, right? This is a, a species that she is not familiar with. And so she is going to uh, investigate, right? So she captures 27 adult male specimens and weighs and measures them. And here are her results. So one of the things to, to remember, it is entirely safe to assume that basically any biological thing referencing size and lots of other stuff too, like IQ, for instance, is, is normally distributed uh, among humans. I, I have no idea about how you measure IQ and other things, uh, but all the stuff, length, mass, height, et cetera, all that stuff, totally reasonable to assume that it's normally distributed. As far as I know, there are no species anywhere that have anything about their size that's not normally distributed. So yeah, so totally, totally safe to assume normal distributions for all of these, which means this 27 is, although it's less than 30, it's, it's awfully close, but uh, you can, you can, and you can assume that the population is normally distributed for all of these variables. Um, and to be honest, this is close enough to 30 that I'd be willing to accept the, uh, willing to accept the central limit theorem, even if it wasn't. So. Uh, Lauren wants to make 95% confidence intervals for all the data in her table. Should she make T or Z intervals? So every one of these things has an average and a standard deviation. So we know that we're going to, um, how can I say this? So we know that we're, we're, we've got quantitative data. So we don't have to worry about whether we're making proportions or, um, or whether we're, we're using proportions or means. So all means for sure. For none of these, do we know the population standard deviation? This is a new species of crab. We have no way of knowing the population standard deviation because it's new. And as far as we know, nobody's ever seen these things before. So there's no way to know what the population standard deviation is. So we're doing all T distributions, all five of them T distributions. I gave you five of them, by the way, just so you could practice. Certainly don't feel compelled to do all of them. So if we make the, these confidence intervals, let's do one by hand. Do one on the calculator to remind you of how that goes, and uh, and then just say do the other three in the in the same manner. So, the one by hand that we're going to do, uh, well, let's uh, I'll do uh, mass by hand. Uh, is that mass of the crab? Yeah, I'll do mass by hand. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and erase all this stuff. So we we're going to have our confidence interval ci equals uh, let's just do this. Uh, I'll write down the formula here. X bar plus or minus, um, what do we call it in this class? Uh, T alpha over two. Sorry, I, I've seen this called. T alpha over two. I've seen it called T star. I've seen it called TC. I've seen it called T. Is that all of them? Yeah, I think that might be all, all of them. So I, I I forget sometimes which which class we're in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I, my confidence interval looks something like this uh, times S over root N s over the square root of n. All right, so your t alpha over 2 is the thing uh, is you're going to have to get that out of a chart or use inverse t if you want to. Um, we're making 95% confidence intervals with a uh, with 26 degrees of freedom. I think I'm going to I'll, I'll go to the chart. I didn't, I didn't get to go get this before I before I opened everything up here. So I'll, uh, you know what I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll go pause my, uh, my recording here and then pick it back up again when I've got the, uh, got the chart. So I'll pause. All right, I've got my chart open right here. So again, we're gonna want to, um, we, so we had a, a sample size of 20, uh, 27. So that means uh, 26 degrees of freedom. It's of course the left column here. 95% is this second column from our third column from the right. So I want 2.056 for my T alpha over two. That's what I'm looking for. So let's go ahead and go back to the whiteboard. All right, so X bar was our mean. Um, I forgot what that number was, one sec. All right, so our mean was 1170 and our standard deviation, so our sigma was, uh, or excuse me, not our sigma, our S is 125. So that's all the, the pieces I need, right? So this is 1170, 1170 plus or minus 2.056 uh, times S was 125 and 
and was 27. So one thing to point out that, that people do sometimes get wrong, this is not degrees of freedom, this is sample size. So use 27 here, not 26. Even though we used 26 degrees of freedom to find the 2.056, it's just how it works. Okay, uh, so I wanna plug this into calculator. 1170 plus or minus 2.056 times 125 over 27. So I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, we got the 1170. Uh, I'm going to do minus first, minus 2.056 times uh, 125 divided by the square root of 20. Why does it do this to me all the time? It refuses to accept my, my pressing of second. Oh, it's put it in the numerator. Oh, good lord. Come on, calculator. Okay. All right, took it that time. Good. Over root uh, 27. There we go. We got that. Um, and then I'll do the same thing for plus. So I get 1120.54 up to 1219.46 uh, is my answer. I presume that is what it says on the answer sheet. Let's just go have a quick look. Make sure I did that correctly. Where's my answer sheet? Uh, I got buried under stuff. What? Where is it? It keeps rearranging them. I don't know if you uh, if you guys have tried this. Um, I don't know if you guys have, uh, have tried uh, tried sharing your screens, but you know how it gives you a, a list of things. It keeps rearranging all of them. I, I wish it would just leave them in the same spot so I could find them again. Seems uh, seems very strange. So there we go. Eleven seventy, right? Plus or minus two point zero five six gives that thing that we just that we just said. That yay. And there's uh, there's my formula. So that's it. Um, and uh, you can do the same thing for all the other ones. So let's um, let's very quickly pop this into the calculator and see how to do it the easy way, right? So I'm going to use uh, I have a sample size of 27, average 1170, standard deviation of 125. So if I just go to my calculator and do a t interval. Right. So if I go to um, distributions, oh, sorry, it's not, that's not even the right place at all. It's uh, stat tests, stat tests, T interval, number eight. Uh, I'm going to input data, not stats, right? I don't have, I don't have raw data for everything, or excuse me, I'm going to put stats, not data. I said that backwards. I have statistics. I don't have the raw data. So all I have are summary statistics. So my mean was 1170. My standard deviation was 125, 125, come on, guys. And a sample size of 27, confidence level 95%, calculated up. And we get exactly that thing that we just saw. So no surprise. There we go. Oops, that's the answers I actually wanted to go back to. Oh, come on. Come on, Zoom. Just the worksheet. There we go. So. I made all the confidence intervals uh, for these parts. Uh, you can just feel free, unless I specify on the test, you are welcome to just jam them in your calculator. I will ask you to do at least one of them by hand on the test. So there will be a question on the test that says, calculate this confidence interval by hand. And really what I'm just asking there is use the formula, right? I just wanted to see that you remember it or at least have written it down uh, and that you know how to use it. Uh, so the interpretation is the same for all of these. Lauren should be 95% confident that the actual population mean falls within the intervals that you found. Right, so population mean uh, of mass, so mu for mass, is between 1120 and what it was, 1219.6, something like that. Uh, same thing for all the other ones, that the population mean shell width is in whatever interval she found, that she's 95% confident that the population shell height or the average population shell height is in the interval she found, et cetera, et cetera. So Jason is doing something slightly different. Uh, he's studying the same sample of 27 adult male crabs. I, I'm thinking of them as like drawing along the bottom and they've just got these crabs in their boat. Um, and as part of his analysis of their leg lengths, he gave a 95% confidence interval for the mean length of their right front legs of this. So I wanna know what were the sample mean and standard deviation for the uh, legs lengths of the right, right front legs of the sample of crabs. I'm specifying, by the way, um, different right and left 
there are crabs that are asymmetrical. I don't know if you guys have seen fiddler crabs. They have one giant claw and one little one. And so I'm thinking that that, that maybe we, we want to be, that you want to specify right or left um, when, you're, when you're dealing with these guys. So uh, here is the, here's the interval. And the thing you want to remember is the way these intervals are constructed. Do I have that on my whiteboard still? I do. So the way we're constructing these intervals is we always center them at X bar and then go a certain distance on either side. So the middle of the interval is X bar. So if you wanna know what the sample mean is, it's you just find the middle of the interval, right? You can just look at the interval and, and find the middle of it to find the sample mean. And then to find the standard deviation, you have to use this, this bit right here, right? So what was his, uh, what was his sample? I forgot the, the numbers. It was like 10.3 to 12.6, is that what it was? 10.3 to 12.7, all right, so 10.3 to 12.7. So we have that interval of 10.3 to 12.7. The way you wanna think of it is on a number line, at least that's the way I like to think of it. So 10.3 over here, 10.3 over here, 12.7 over there, and then this is X bar, right? So we just wanna find the middle of that. So the easiest way to do that is to take the average and the average here is uh, 11 and a half. Yeah, because this is 23, if you add these up. So this guy is 11.5, 11.5. Another way to do that would be to say, okay, well, it is 2.4 units across from 10.3 to 12.7. So that must mean that it is 1.2 units from the middle to either side. And you can see 10.3, you add 1.2 to that, you get 11.5, et cetera. So, um, that's the that's the mean. So to find the standard deviation, you need to use uh, this. You need to use this part right here. That's the margin of error, right? And so we know this is the same sample. So it's got the it's got the the um, the same. Um, what, what am I trying to say here? Same t alpha over two, right? So we know that this distance of one point two here. This right here, right here one point two that far, that means that 1.2 is equal to 2.056 times S over the square root of N, but we know that the N is still 27. So you just solve that for S, right? I'm just gonna multiply both sides by root 27, divide by 2.056, and that's what I get. Whatever I get there is uh, what's left for S. So that is how I got this number down here. Yeah, see, solving for solving equation for S gives us S is about 3.03. So there you go. So um, if Jason and Lauren want to be more than 95% confident of capturing the population meaning their confidence intervals, what are their options? Well, they could use, if they want to be more confident, they're going to have to make their intervals bigger, right? Uh, because capturing more area will make you more confident that you've got the mean in there. Um, so if they wanted to be 98% confident, you would just find the, the critical value for 98% and make your intervals the, the requisite amount bigger. Um, the other option is to take a bigger sample. So you, if they wanna be more than 95% confident, they can do like make a 99% confidence interval that isn't any wider than the 95% confidence interval, as long as they get enough more um, crabs, as long as they, they capture enough more crabs to, to measure. So take a bigger sample or just, uh, or accept the trade-off between um, confidence and precision. Those are their options. All right, so here is a thing that I actually did when I first started teaching statistics, where we use the book way more in class than we do now, not that we actually have class these days, but uh, we used a book that had a lot of uh, exercises in it for the class to do, and it was kind of fun. It worked out pretty well. Um, so uh, as an exercise in practical statistics, we took a poll in the class and then we made confidence intervals based on the poll. Uh, and here are the confidence intervals that we made. I actually, I, I, I'm lying a little bit. I, I did this in two classes, but I don't remember. These, these numbers are not correct. The numbers are broadly correct. Uh, we used the book a lot in class and we did get a, peop a couple of people who said that we used the book too little, but not very many. So um, in this case, I've got 59 people in the classes. 19 said we used the book too much. 38 said we use the book too little and uh, two said, or excuse me, 38% said we use the book 
the right amount, but I've, re I've arranged these very strangely. Too much, too little, right amount? Okay. Like I said, did these in Goldilocks order, right? Too hot, too cold, just right. So too much, too little, right amount. 38% um, said the right amount. That's number three. And then uh, two said we use the book too little. So to make 95% confidence intervals here, um, for the portion of all students who would say we use the book too much, and when I say all students, I don't just mean the students in this class. What I mean is, if I taught this class in the same in the same way with other with many other students, many other classes of students, that what would we expect them to say, right? That's I'm thinking of these two uh, these two classes that I am teaching at this point as a sample of all possible students not uh it, that's not like the the 59 students is not the population the 59 students is the sample right uh, it's the sample of all possible students so uh for the proportion of all students who say that we use the book too much and for the proportion of all students who say we use the book the right amount so too much was 19 out of 59 and right amount was 38 out of 59 so 19 out of 59 so what i'm going to do is i'm going to make a uh, make a conference interval. So I'm just going to go to the whiteboard and put the formula on here. Let's go ahead and just make another one of these. Maybe when I come back to that. So um, my confidence interval in this case is going to be um, the sample proportion. So P prime plus or minus Z alpha over two, because we're only doing this with Z or with the normal distributions times this times the, the standard error. Right, so our, our standard error is p prime q prime over n. Right, so that's what I want to use for my formula. So the first thing to do is calculate our p primes and then find our z alpha over 2 and our n was 59. We know what that is. So z alpha over 2, I believe I'm making 95% confidence intervals. Just remind myself that that's correct. 95% uh, confidence interval. Yeah, those are the, the standard ones. Um, so that means that I'm going to want to use z equal uh, z alpha over two equals 1.96. Right? You can go check that in your calculator, but that's that's what it is. 1.96. Okay. So uh, 19 out of 59 is. Uh, so I'm going to turn that into a decimal right off the bat. It's not always the greatest idea to approximate something early in the problem, but just to avoid typing all the fractions, it's not going to make that much difference. So we're just going to get 19 divided by 59, and we get uh, 0 0.322. So that's going to be my uh, my p prime. So let's go uh, let's go back to the whiteboard here. So I've got uh, p prime in this case. P prime equals 0 0.322. So that means I'm going to uh, have my confidence interval of 0 0.322 plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of 0 0.322. And I'm going to go ahead and just do our do our quick uh, quick subtraction method um, from 1 here, right? So I want 9, 9, 10 here. So 6, uh, 6, 7, 8, 0 0.678. And uh, that is 59 in the bottom. And then we just jam that in the calculator and see what we get. And when we do this, um, using the calculator's uh, proportion, uh, proportion, one prop Z interval. What we're going to find is we'll get slightly different numbers because 19 over 59 is not exactly 0.322, right? It's actually 0.322, 0 0.3389, etc. Right, so I'm just rounding this off. We'll have a little bit of rounding error here, but I'm not, like this is so, such a small rounding error, I'm not worried about it. So 0.322 minus 1.96 times the square root Will it accept my square root? It did. Great. Uh, 0 0.322 times uh, 0 0.678 divided by 59. There we go. We get that. So there's a lower bound and our upper bound. And so this means that I should be 95% certain, or not, I should be 95% confident, is really the, the phrasing I want to use, that between 20.28 and 44.12 percent of all students that I taught in the same way with the same book would say that I use the uh, that I use the book too much. Is that what I did? Yeah, that I use the book too much. 
let's just remind us uh, how to do this in the calculator. So I love these in the calculator, they're so easy. Uh, stat, test, one prop, z interval, uh, where is that? Oh yeah, it's way down here. One prop, z interval. Um, X is the number of successes. That's 19 of the people uh, we were talking to, or 19 of the people in the class out of the 59 in the class. Confidence level 95%. And there we go, 20.2 to 44.1, just like we said before, right? So there's a very, very small amount of rounding error, but I don't, I'm not gonna worry about it. There you go. And again, uh, I'm 95% confident that between 20.3% and 44.1% uh, of all students would say that I use the book too much in this class. And we do the same thing for too little, or excuse me, no, we do the same thing for right amount. Can't do too little. That's actually one of the questions down here. Um, we do the same thing for, for right amount and it's 38 out of, yeah, it's 38 out of 59. <coughs> so we're just using a, a different, um, a different X there, which give us different P prime, of course. Um, that's uh, that, that's how we make the make the interval there. I'll, I'll leave you to do that. Uh, using the Wilson score interval, or Wilson score interval, all we have to do there is add two successes and two failures, or two successes and and um, four sample size, right? And so let's see what that looks like. Uh, wait, which I'm sorry, which one am I doing here? Use the Wilson square to be confident that it's for the same things. Okay, so I'll just do the 19 out of 59. So if I add two successes and four sample size, 4n, I'm going to use 21 successes out of 63 people. That's it. It's actually very easy to do, right? There's there's almost no adjustment to even make. Just uh, 21 out of 63, which is, of course, exactly a third. Calculate it. And what we get is this, 21.7% to 44 point, or 45%. You might ask yourself, like, this seems like a pointless exercise. Why would we ever do that, right? How does this actually help? So I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Feel free to zoom ahead if you don't want a tangent. So the tangent goes something like this. There is something called uh, coverage probability. So there's a difference between confidence level and coverage probability in that the T distribution or the, the distribution that we're using is not exactly a normal distribution. It's actually a variant of the T distribution um, that you can use with proportions. Um, and so what the Wilson score adjustment is doing or the Wilson score interval is, is doing is it's taking a weighted average in kind of an interesting way. It's taking a weighted average of your data the, the proportion in your data and one half and it's weighting it on a sliding scale from what your data is or from uh, depending on that that slides based on the sample size so the bigger the sample size the more weighted it is towards your data and the smaller the sample size the more weighted it is towards a half and so all he's really doing all uh, is taking a half and doing a weighted average with that and your, your sample size. And the, the half is two out of four. It's the, the two successes in four tries. And you might say, well, why not three out of six or five out of 10 or you know, whatever? Turns out there's actually a fair amount of math behind that. And it's, it's not actually two out of four that you really want to use. Believe it or not, it's, it's, I don't remember what the actual, what the actual decimal is. Um, to, to weight it with a half, you're actually weighting it with, with something that's, that's uh, uh, I, sorry, I'm getting the details right now because it's been a long time since I actually derived this. Um, but two out of, like, it turns out that two out of four is very close to the ideal value to use. So the actual ideal value was like 1.98 out of 3.96 or something like that. I, those aren't the right numbers. So it's just, it's very close to that. Um, and so, uh, that's why that's why they use two out of four is because that's very close to the the actual um, mathematically derived ideal version of one half that you want to use to to do this. So there you go. There's there's the end of the tangent. Um, that's a, a oh sorry maybe that's not the end of the tangent because I didn't even talk about coverage probability. So coverage probability is 
the actual probability of seeing your uh, seeing your your um, in this case sample proportion fall in the interval that you made. The nominal coverage probability is the confidence level, but the actual coverage probability varies slightly uh, from that for reasons that are a bit too technical to go into here. Um, but doing this Wilson score adjustment causes the coverage probability to match more closely with the uh, with the actual with the excuse me cause it to match the confidence level more closely so there's actually this interval actually has a very uh, a slightly closer to 95% confidence level than the 95% confidence interval we made I know that seems very strange, but like I said, the math behind this is, is relatively complicated and the reason why you'd want to do it, it's fairly technical. So um, I'm going to skip those, but just be aware that this actually does a slightly better job of matching the confidence level for proportions, doing the, the Wilson score adjustment. And when you're, yeah, and I, get, I guess that's where I want to say it. So the coverage probability of this interval is slightly closer than, closer to 95% than the coverage probability of the other interval that we did, which was, um, a little bit too high, or the, it, rather, it was a. Sorry, that one was a little bit too. Yeah, the the coverage probability on the other one was a, was slightly too large. It was it was actually a little bit better than or a little bit bigger than ninety five percent. But this interval is slightly more precise. So there you go. That's that, there's the actual end of the tangent. That's what the Wilson score adjustment is doing. It's doing something kind of fancy in a, that has a really really easy adjustment. Right, the the actual adjustment is just add two to this number and four to that one, and then do do it again. Right, that that process is super simple, um, but it's doing something that's that's kind of technically interesting. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about that. That's uh, that's the the Wilson score adjustment. All right, so um, what happens to p prime and the margin of error in, uh, in each case? Uh, the margin of error will get slightly smaller, and p prime will get slightly closer to fifty percent. That's what always happens. It's a, it's a weighted average uh, to weighted average with fifty percent, and your margin of error is getting smaller because your sample size is getting larger, or not the real sample size, but your your the sample size you are using as n is getting larger. So for C, we can't use this data to make a reliable confidence interval for the proportion of all students who say we use the book too little because there were only two people who said that, and we need a sample size, or we need five successes and five failures in order to make our confidence intervals in this way. Interestingly, we could we could do this. So I I said this in, in a way that's not it's not quite true. We actually could uh, use this data to make a reliable confidence interval for the proportion of all students who say we use the book too little if we use the binomial distribution instead of a normal distribution, right? The normal distribution is just an approximation of the binomial distribution. So we could use the binomial distribution to do it in this case. And that would, that would um, work okay. That would work okay. Uh, how many students would I have needed to poll in order to get a margin of error of no more than 2% in part A, assuming the proportions in each category were roughly the same. So I'm asking about what sample size I should use, what's my sample size determination. And if you remember, we have a formula for that. It is our sample size determination formula. I'm just gonna click over the answers because I'm sure I put it in here. I, oh yeah, it's down here, good. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, yeah, there it is. There's our, our sample size determination formula. Margin of error is Z alpha over two times the square root of P prime Q prime over N, right? And so what we end up doing is we solve that for uh, N. Right? We, we just end up solving this for n, just like we did back in chapter eight. I went through the whole algebraic derivation of it then. I'm not going to do it now. Uh, we end up with this, this thing right here. So if we want to do it this way, um, certainly we could, uh, yeah, certainly we could uh, use the actual p prime and q prime that we had here um, to get our, our best approximation of n. We could also if we wanted to be more conservative, use p prime and q prime both equal to 0.5, which will give you the largest possible n. Um, yeah, so the, either one of those, depending on how confident you're feeling about the original sample, if I was feeling, I would feel pretty good about the original sample and probably just use the p prime that I got from there, right? So I would use p prime is 0.322 and q prime is 0.678 for the people percentage of people who said we use the book too much. Um, but you could use p primes 0.5, q primes 0.5, uh, 
to get a more conservative estimate for n. But anyway, we jam this into the calculator and we get these things. All right, so this question, uh, here I'm, what I'm trying to do with this problem is just ask a question to make you think about the formulas in uh, for confidence interval more as, as formulas that you would see in algebra. Um, but if you uh, if you so this is this is not a question that I'm, I'm not going to ask anything like this on the on the midterm. This was really just my way of like sneaking something into the test review to make you think a little bit more. But even though it's not really going to be on the test, but here, here's how you uh, here's how you find these things, right? So if I have my if my confidence interval is a to b. So left end of A, right end of B. Um, and this is a confidence interval for P, right? So that means it's uh, it's proportions. Then uh, I can just do this. So the P prime is in the middle. Uh, so it's the average of, the, of A and B. Margin of error is the distance from one edge to the other. Oh, excuse me, from the middle to one edge, right? And so the distance from one edge to the other is B minus A. So it's just uh, the right edge minus the left. And then you would divide that by two to find the margin of error because it's, it's, it's there's two margins of error in a whole confidence interval. And the sample size, this one is, uh, this is one of the ones that uh, I just wanted to give people who, who were in the mood to do more confidence interval stuff uh, so and, and want to do some algebra. Uh, something to do. You don't have to do this. Um, I'm not going to go through the derivation here, but this is this I'm doing. Uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah, if you're really interested, I'll, I'll be happy to, to show you. So it's, uh, it's a little bit, you got to get a little fancy with the algebra to get this. All right, so for hypothesis testing, uh, we're just going to do some hypothesis tests here. So um, here we've got uh, voting. Yeah, yes, I love this. I don't know if you guys have ever seen CGP Gray. He has a really, really good uh, series on different voting systems on YouTube. I would highly recommend it. His channel is fantastic. Uh, okay, so instant runoff voting is a type of voting. Uh, it's a type of, of voting system. So the, the one that we use that you're probably familiar with, or that I, I'm sure you're familiar with, is what's called first past the post. In other words, let's say you have six people running for something you just you throw them on in, in the same pool and everybody gets to vote for one and uh, whoever gets the most vote, most votes wins there you go very simple it turns out that is actually quite problematic and if you watch these videos which i will encourage you to do i will just say that this if you have six um six groups right like let's say you have six political parties what will happen naturally just by doing this is that four of them get weeded out um, because you what you'll what you'll end up with is basically two camps one that gravitates towards one point of view and one that gravitates towards another one because of the the correct strategy that someone would employ in a system like this so instant runoff voting is um different what you do is so let's say we have six people or we have uh, six political parties you rank them one through six and then uh, whoever gets the least or rank one through six, and then count up all the all the first place votes. And then if somebody's uh, or then you, you so I'd say it's badly. The top five placers in that. Uh, so whoever's in sixth place, they get eliminated, and then their second place votes all get added onto the vote totals of the other groups. And then you eliminate another one, and then all their third place or all their second place vote totals get added on to the other groups. And so the idea here is that if there's one one group that you like, that you like the most, but they're unpo they're not very popular, right? You like group six, or you like political party number six the most, um, but they're not very popular, and they lose they're, they're, they lose the election. You can still feel okay about voting for your representative from party number six, because let's say you also, you're okay with party number two, they're not your first choice, but they'd, they'd be all right. Because your vote for number six won't be wasted if you lose, right? You'll still get your, 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 your second favorite choice will still get your vote in that case. Um, and that's, 
again, I, I don't know why I'm trying to explain all this. Watch the videos. They're great. Uh, is, that's what instant runoff voting is, is it lets you, uh, it lets you, it, it is a, a system for determining whose second and third and fourth place votes um, go to, right? And they count just as much as a, as a first place vote. So anyway, um, <laughs> as you can see, some people find this confusing, reasonably so. <laughs> Uh, is it, it's it's an unusual or it's a it's a voting method it's used in lots of places, um, but it's not uh, it's not the norm at least in the United States. So, uh, thirty eight percent of uh, instant runoff voting people found instant runoff voting confusing, and forty one percent would be against implementing it for national elections. And by the way, this is this is real data. I went and looked this up at some point when I when I wrote this problem. So you convince one hundred and forty five randomly selected registered voters to watch the series of videos and pull them after the videos about whether IRV is confusing and how they feel about implementing it for national elections. 40 of them find IRV confusing and 46% would be against using it for national elections. So that's 40 of the 145 and 46 out of the 145 find it confusing. I'm looking at the answers here, aren't I? That's fine. So I wanna perform a hypothesis test. So let me, let me switch back to here so we can look at the questions without without having to look at the answers too. So I want to perform a hypothesis test. So the way you want to think about a hypothesis test is first thing we need to do is write some hypotheses to test. So that's actually not the first thing. The first thing you really need to do is read the problem uh, to the point where you could explain it to somebody without having to refer to the problem itself. So I'm not, uh, I promise I'm not, uh, not looking at the problem here. So my explanation of this is I want to check to see if what CGP Gray did in his videos helped people understand instant runoff voting, um, helped more of them feel like it was less confusing. So the original uh, the original numbers just in a national poll said that 38%, 38% of it, 38% found instant runoff voting confusing. So I want to see if the percentage of people in my sample is different enough from that to make me think that the videos were effective. Like that's that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that, that's what I want to do. Uh, after they watch the videos, is the same as the national. Oh, sorry, I said uh, is, is was effective in helping them. After they watch the videos linked above, is the same as the national is same as the national average has an implied or not. So I should really be multiplying my p-value by two here because I'm, I'm going to do this on, on both sides. So alpha equals 5%. And so now when, once I've understood the problem, I'm going to go write my, uh, go write my hypotheses, right? And so the original was 38%. So my null hypothesis is that p is 38% or 0 0.38, I guess. Uh, the alternative hypothesis is that P is not 38%. That, that's not beta, beta. P is not 38%. And because it is just different then, I'm going to be looking at both sides here. And so uh, then I got to find my, my P prime. My P prime in this case was 40 out of, that's terrible, 40. Let's, let's undo that. 40 out of 145. Uh, and then the corresponding Q prime. Um, well, well, we'll use that in a, in a bit here. So my P prime is, is this, and then I'm going to plug it into my, I'm basically gonna find my P value uh, using that, right? So I, I need to check to see if I can use the center limit theorem for proportions, which of course I can, because I just need five successes and five failures. And here I've got, 40 successes and 145 or in, and 105 failures, both of which are much bigger than, than five. Um, so then I'm going to make a normal distribution. It is centered at 38%, so 0 0.38. And so I got to find my uh, P prime here. So let's, let's go to the calculator. 40 out of 145 is, 27 point, 0 0.275, yeah, 0.275. About equal to 0 0.2759, which is pretty different than 38%, right? That's 27.6% or thereabouts. So that's gonna be over here somewhere. 
0.2759 is over there. Uh, there's going to be a corresponding uh, corresponding value on the other side that's that's equally far away, and then my p value is this area plus this area. All right, those two things right there are my p value. So I'm going to go ahead and find those. So I need to find what this what this distribution is. I know what the mean is 0.38, right? Because that's what my uh, my hypothesized uh, hypothesized population proportion is, but I need to find out what um, uh, what the standard deviation is, right? And so um, the central limit theorem for proportions tells us that p prime is approximately normal with a mean of p and a standard deviation of the square root of pq over n. And you might say, wait a minute, I thought that was p prime q prime over n. It is. When we, it, well, okay. It is actually this. It's actually square root of PQ over N. We use P prime and Q prime when we're doing confidence intervals because we don't have a hypothesized value of P, right? Here we do, right? Our null hypothesis says that P is 38%. And so that allows us to calculate what the standard deviation would be if that was true, which of course is how we get our null distribution in the first place. So uh, let's go find this. Uh, so 0.2759, okay. Let's go here. So I need to do the square root of 0 0.2759 times uh, 1 minus that is going to be, um, again, I'm going to go 99910 here. So it's uh, 7241, 0 0.7241 divided by the sample size, which is 145. And we get that 0 0.0371 yeah, is, is our uh, Standard EBR is our standard error. That's what I'm trying to say. So this is N 0 0.38, 0 0.0371, right? So our standard deviation is 3.7%, right? And we can see from here that we went about, about 10%. That's about three of these. So I'm expecting this number to be really small. It should be around 0.3%, around. 3 around something something a little bit less than than one percent uh, i'll say and so when we uh when we calculate this area i'm going to do two times normal cdf of minus infinity up to 0.2759 let's see what we get okay so 0.2759 divided by the a uh, mean of 0 0.38 and a standard deviation of 0 0.0371 and see what we get. I don't have to multiply this by two because I forgot to put the two times, so times two. And of course it's tiny, right? That's not 5%, that's 0.5%, really, really small. So we're gonna reject the null hypothesis. Uh, I wanna do this using the tests menu once, just to, again, to remind you how to do that. So stat tests. This is a one prop Z test. Yeah, this is a one prop Z test, one proportion. Uh, and we had uh, point, so P0 is, the, hypo, is the, the proportion associated with the null hypothesis. So in other words, it's, it's whatever we're using, whatever the null hypothesis tells us for the population proportion, which is 38%. So 0 0.038 or 0 0.38, you have to enter this as a decimal. No, and you can't say 38%, um, the calculator will not like that. It doesn't even have a percent key. Um, X and N is same as before, number of successes, number of trials. So we had 40 people out of 145. And our alternative hypothesis was not equal to, so let's calculate it up. There we go. So P value of, that's pretty different. I guess this is just rounding error, right? The, so they got, they got like about 1% and I got about 0.5% from rounding error. So I must've rounded up a couple times. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that, that's all there is to it. So the these uh, the test menu tests are great; they're really handy. Um, on the on the test, I will ask you to do at least one where I say, "All right, find the okay, write my hypotheses, find the sampling distribution, label your sampling distribution, circle the circle the area that's the the equal to the p value um, on your on your sampling distribution." Write a conclude or then determine if you're rejecting the null hypothesis and write a conclusion. So um, 
I'm going to ask you to see all the steps, but if I don't specifically say something like that, feel free to just do this, right? Just hit the button. That's what I would do, right? The, like, since I'm fairly comfortable doing these, I don't feel any need to go through all the intermediate steps. And once you are very, once you are fairly comfortable with them, there's really no need for you to either. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Uh, I did one prop Z test, P value 0 0.0097. And by the way, uh, um, a very reasonable question might be, okay, so doing this, I get 0 0.00978, doing the other way, I get 0 0.005 something, 0 0.005, yeah. Those are pretty different answers. Am I going to get credit if I do, if I get the 0 0.005, but the answer is actually 0 0.0097? And the answer is, on a test, I am looking to see whether you understand what you are doing. So if the way you do it is by hand, like you calculate your, your P prime and you, you know, draw your, your curve and you circle the area or you shade in the area that corresponds to the P value, um, then yeah, totally fine, 100% fine, like full credit, absolutely. Uh, even if the number that you get is slightly different than the number that I got from rounding error. I'm well aware that rounding error occurs in these all the time. And so what I'll do is if I get it, if, if you got like, let's say you went to, you know, seven decimal places instead of the instead of the what three or four i used uh and your answer was much closer to this is like 0 0.0096 right i would just look at that and go yeah yeah that's just that's clearly rounding error if instead i you put down 0 0.005 uh and did this i would go do the problem the way you the way you had it i would just use your numbers and type them into my calculator and, and go through go through the problem and see if what you did was the right process. And if it is, you get full credit. Um, and if it's not, then I'll try and find where the error was. Um, but in general, uh, this is just an argument for showing your work, right? In statistics, everything has a million decimal places and everything gets rounded off at some point and where you round off and by how much you round off, by where I mean, where in the process you round off, like which at which step you start rounding, as well as the amount of decimal accuracy that you're carrying will give you a different answer. Um, and so if you feel like, well, not even if you feel like, just show your work and then I can see that you know the process. And if a number, if there's, you know, some number went quote unquote wrong, but it was, but you were using the right numbers and all, all along and you just rounded differently than me, there is absolutely no problem with that. That is 100% fine. I'm not interested in the numbers that you get. I'm interested in the process that you do. Um, and I only use the numbers that you get as a quick check to see if you did the process right, right? And so like, if you if you do this and your answer is 0 0.00978, clear, the only way you're gonna get that number is if you did the process right, right? So that just, it just shortens, it just makes it so I don't have to do everybody's work based on how they round it. Um, yeah, so, there, so I guess that, that's the answer. Show your work, uh, round, use a reasonable number of decimal places. Don't just use like, you know, one decimal place. Use three or four uh, and, then, and you'll you'll be close enough every time. Okay, uh, let me go back to uh, here. All right, so um, perform a hypothesis test. So we need to uh, write a conclusion. So my conclusion for this would be that I am rejecting the null hypothesis because my p-value was really small um, and therefore, I think that the, uh, the the proportion of viewers or the proportion of voters who feel that instant runoff voting is confusing after they watch these videos is not the same as the proportion of viewers uh, who, or proportion of voters who would find instant runoff voting confusing if they didn't watch the video, right? So another way of saying that, a much, much clearer way and more plain English is to say that these videos seem to help people understand instant runoff voting, right? The, the proportion of people who find it confusing decreases after they watch the videos, which is what you'd expect. Uh, you do the same thing for would be against it for national elections, um, same pro same exact process, right? Different different numbers, but the same, the same process. So you get that. Uh, this, right? So our, our proportion here was 41% would be a, a against it in national elections. And we found 46 of our, uh, 46 of our, our 
of our 145 people would be against it using national elections. So uh, you go through the whole process again, you get the, the same result, right? It's a slightly larger p-value, but not, not tremendously so. So we reject H not in this case as well. And so we would say that the number of people or the pr proportion of, of voters who would be against using instant runoff voting in a national election uh, decreases or changes, I should say, changes after we uh, after they watch these videos. To make 95% confidence intervals, jam it in your calculator, right? 40 out of 145, 40 and uh, 46 out of 145. One prophecy interval. It's, uh, I assume that's what I did here. Oh no, I uh, actually did it all out. So this is what you get when you do um, one prophecy interval, right? Same method as above, just by hand. I would just do one prophecy interval here. And then the, the connection between hypothesis testing and confidence intervals is that confidence intervals basically give you a reasonable range of values for whatever statistic you're making a confidence interval for. So we're making a confidence interval for P in this case. So that means that the range that we get, 0.203 to 0.349, is what we consider a reasonable range for P. If our proposed statistic, our, our proposed population value here, our proposed P, falls in that interval, then we would not want to reject our null hypothesis that P was that number. P does not fall in this interval though, right? Our, our P0 in the calculator, or the, the P that we had in our null hypothesis was 38%. And this is 20.3 up to 34.9%, right? 38 is higher than that. So according to our data, we don't think that 38% is a reasonable value for P. That's why we reject our null hypothesis. And also, it does not fall into this interval. That connection holds up mostly. Um, let me read you this caveat here. This only works if you do your interval and your hypothesis test in parallel ways. Just to say, the alpha that you choose for your hypothesis test has to be one minus your confidence level in your confidence interval. and the confidence interval that you're making has to be two-sided. It's possible to make one-sided confidence intervals. We're not going to go into that here. Uh, that's not, not on the test. Um, but you have to make a two-sided confidence interval whose confidence level is one minus alpha. Uh, one minus the alpha that you use for your hypothesis test. And then these things will match up. Exactly. They match up mostly, anyway, but uh, they'll, they'll match more precisely if you, if you meet those requirements. All right, one more hypothesis test to do. Uh, as with the test, you're going to see that we've got a proportions confident, uh, proportions hypothesis test and a means hypothesis test. That's that's the sort of thing I'm going to do on uh, on the test as well. In fact, I've got uh, two means hypothesis tests here, right? Um, yeah, one of them one of them where we know sigma and the other one where we don't. A uh, power company running a particular coal power plant is trying to reduce their emissions. To this point, they have emitted about 10,000 tons of CO2 per day, but now they're trying a new filtration system that they will hope will reduce that. So they hire uh, an independent lab to monitor their emissions for two months to see if the filtration system is helping. In the 61 days they monitored the emissions, the average was this many, 8,752 tons of CO2 per day with standard deviation of 2,740 tons. So. Um, when I read through this, the things that the things that I'm looking for before I do anything else, I know it's going to be a, I know it's going to be a hypothesis test, right? It's given right here. You can read the question, like do a hypothesis test. When I read this, then the first question I ask myself is: Is my data quantitative or qualitative? Right? Am I doing this for means or proportions? Uh, this one is for means. Right, And so once I know that it's for means, then I have to ask myself, do I have the population standard deviation or do I only have a sample standard deviation? Right. So this, the only standard deviation given here is this 2740. And this and this are, are specifically referencing that in the 61 days they monitored the emissions. So in other words, in the sample, the mean 
was 87.52 and the standard deviation of the sample was 27.40. So I don't have population of standard deviation, I only have S. So that means I'm doing a T distribution, or I'm doing a T test here. So uh, I got a mean of 87.52 and a standard deviation of 27.40 in 61 days. So N is 61, X bar is 87.52. And S is 2,740, which is relatively large to, compared to this mean. Um, and we wanted to see if the if the emissions have gone down from 10,000 tons per day. So let's do that. Make one of these. So my null hypothesis is that the the mean hasn't gone down; it's still the same. Mu equals 10,000. My alternative hypothesis is that the mean has gone down now that I've uh, using the, now that I'm using a new filtration system. All right, and then we had uh, we had mu equal or not mu x bar x bar equals it looks like capital x bar it's not it's lowercase was eighty seven ninety two. I forgot the numbers. I'm sorry. I have to switch back. I don't know if you guys can hear my chair squeaking there, but it's uh, squeaking away. Uh, 8752, 2740. All right, let's go write those down. 8752, 52. S was 2740. Uh, and N was 61 days, so two months. 61. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna find our sampling distribution. Uh, so this is this is gonna be a T distribution. So this is zero here, and this is gonna be T60. And so we have to find our T score from this, right? So we're gonna do T equals T score is X bar minus mu over S over root N, which is X, that's 87.52, minus 10,000 divided by S over root N. So 2740 over the square root of 61. All right, so we're gonna jam that into our calculator to get a T score. Let's do that. Um, it was 87, I totally forgot, 8752, I'm sorry. <laughs> getting, getting forgetful here. Uh, I apologize, I'm gonna just go look at it. Oop. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so our T score, 8752 minus 10,000. If you're clever, you could you could do the same thing that we've done before where we subtract from one, right? And so I want nine, 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 ten here effectively. So this is going to come out to be one, two, four, eight, negative in this case, negative 1248. Uh, I'm going to divide by S over root N. So S was 2740, 740 divided by the square root of 61. This number looks like it's going to be pretty big here. Yeah, T score of negative 3.5, uh, 3.55. So let's go put that on our distribution. Over here, negative three. It should probably be farther to the left, but it is fine here. And then we're going to shade in the direction of the alternative hypothesis that is to the left. So these guys, this area right here, that's what I'm finding. And then that area is my p-value. So I will go use TCDF. TCDF of minus infinity up to negative 3.557. So I go to distributions, TCDF is number six. Lower bound minus infinity, upper bound negative 3.557 degrees of freedom, 60 degrees of freedom. And then we will paste that in. We get this very tiny number, 0. 0.0003698. So notice, I don't don't think of this as 3.698. It's 3.698 times 10 to the negative four. So this moves three four to the left. So give me three zeros to the left of this three. So 0. 
0.00003698. So very, very small, right? Less than three chances or less than four chances in 10,000, right? So this is this is small enough to, to reject the null hypothesis. So our conclusion is going to be that the it seems like the filtration system is working, right? Our, our emissions are down, so everything's great. There you go. Uh, at alpha equals one percent, indeed, at any reasonable alpha, this is a, this is enough evidence. This is even smaller than an alpha of one percent. Uh, Ninety-nine percent confidence interval. So uh, you just jam that into the calculator to make a t interval in the calculator. I guess I haven't done one of those yet in this uh, in this video, so we'll, we'll go ahead and do one. I'll make a t interval. Uh, nope, not the second. Two stat tests t interval. That is number eight here. Uh, we want statistics, and we've got x bar of 87.52. I can't. I don't know why I can't remember that number. 87.52. S was 27.40. Uh, N was 61. Yeah, and 99% uh, confidence interval. I believe I asked for. So that's 99. And there we go. So I am 99% confident in that. The the emissions with the the average emissions average daily emissions with the new filtration system falls between 7818.7 and 9685.3 tons per day. Notice that 10,000 is not in this interval as we would expect. It was not because we rejected the null hypothesis. Right, 10,000 is not a reasonable value for uh, mu if this is what our data looks like. And so we reject we reject the null hypothesis and 10,000 is not in the interval. Uh, there we go. And uh, last hypothesis testing question. St. Bernard's are big. Uh, Jason's a vet tech who is, whose roommate claims that they weigh on average 200 pounds. Jason thinks his roommate might be right for once, uh, but he decides to test his claim anyway. So uh, Jason knows from previous research that their weights are normally distributed with a standard deviation of 30 pounds. And so he weighs the next 12 St. Bernard's that are brought into his clinic over the next 34, next month, getting an average of 208 pounds with a standard deviation of 34 pounds. So again, let's go back to what we're doing. We know it's a hypothesis test. So within that, we're gonna to need to write hypotheses. Well, absent other information, our null hypothesis is going to be that the weight is 200 pounds. Jason's gonna give his roommate the benefit of the doubt. Um, yeah, the, uh, and he knows that the standard deviation is 30 pounds. So I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I forgot to talk about what kind of data we've got. So this is quantitative data, right? We're talking about numbers and averages, right? Not yes or no, uh, it's not a yes or no question like, do you find it still run off photo confusing? No, this is a question of how heavy are these dogs, uh, which is a number. So quantitative data, uh, once we know that, the next question to ask is, do we know sigma? And the answer here is yes, surprisingly, right? So it, so among common animals, there, there's a lot of things that we know about them. Um, and St. Bernard's are not like some rare breed of dog. Uh, so yeah, we, we've done a lot of research on uh, St. Bernard's in the past. And as a as a, a community, humanity is fairly fairly confident that the, the standard deviations uh, standard deviation is about 30 pounds. So that's what we're going to use for our population standard deviation. So we actually do know with sigma in this case. So even though I have S, I am going to ignore this number because it is not useful to me. It is better to do a um, it's better to do a Z test than a T test. A T test is just an approximate approximation of a Z test. Um, so uh, I, I I suppose I should uh, should say this. So can we do a Z test in this case? The answer is yes. Even though n is just twelve, that doesn't matter because we know sigma. So the reason we need to do Z versus T is that the central limit theorem only applies in cases in, uh, in two cases, or you need to meet one requirement to have the central limit theorem apply, right? You need to know that the population is normally distributed or that the sample size is, um, or excuse me, or that the, the population 
where, where did I say? Population is normally distributed, sample size is at least 30, sample size is big. Um, and we don't have sample size being big, but that's okay because we know that the population is normally distributed because we're talking about the mass of the mass of a biological object here. Biological creature. Let's say creature instead of biological object. That sounds a lot better. It's a dog. <laughs> and so we want to know um, we're we that's what we're testing. So we're confident that the population is normally distributed. So we don't actually need a big sample size in order to use a z-test because we, we have the population standard deviation. So we're okay. We're okay to do a, a z-test here. That's the that's why I asked uh, this question. What kind of test should Jason do? So I guess uh, I, I might as well go through the whole thing after that <laughs> rambling and confused explanation. So we're going to have null hypothesis. It's not. Is that mu equals 200 ha? is that we are checking to see if it equals 200 or not. So mu not equal to 200 is what we've got here. We had um, our X bar was 208 and we know that sigma is 30 and N is just 12. So, um, so here we've got, uh, this is N 200 comma 30 over root 12, right? Sigma over root n and uh, center to 200 here. And our 208 is over here, 208. Now our, our alternative hypothesis is a not equal to, so I have to do two sides again, right? And so we, we're gonna do the same distance over here, which is actually 192, but we don't actually need to know that number. Because all I'm gonna do is do normal CDF on this area and then double it to find the other one. And then we'll, we'll do it uh, doing Z test in the calculator too. So normal CDF of 208 to infinity with a standard with a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 30 over root 12. So um, yeah, normal CDF number two here, we are going from 208 to infinity. So there's some big number with a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 30 divided by the square root of 12. I don't know if you guys have a good feel for um, whether you're gonna end up rejecting the null hypothesis here. I'm fairly confident that we're, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis because this 208 is pretty close to 200, right? That's, that's really what you're testing is, is this thing that we found enough different from our hypothesis that makes us want to reject it. And this doesn't look like it's that far away, right? Also our sample size isn't, isn't very uh, big. So we would need a very, very strong indicator of them being different with a sample size of only 12. And this doesn't seem like a very strong indicator to me. So I'm expecting a relatively large number here. And we're gonna have to double this because we have a not equal to this, right? So that times two, yeah. And then we get a p-value of 35%, right? So big much bigger than 5%. So that's, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis here. Back to worksheet. So um, yeah, and then we can make a 95% confidence interval. I'll go ahead and do that as well. Uh, I guess I'll do Z test and then make a Z interval as well. So perform the appropriate hypothesis test. I did that. So when I say perform the appropriate hypothesis test, keep in mind that that means that you take it all the way to conclusion. So my conclusion here is this is not enough evidence to suggest that Jason's friend is wrong or Jason's roommate is wrong. So we're just going to believe that he's right. If the average is 200 pounds. There's your conclusion. Okay, um, make a 95% confidence interval. Sure. Uh, well, let's actually, let's do the test. Let's do Z test on the calculator at least once in here. So if I go to Z test, that's stat tests, Z test number one. We have, I don't know why they do, they do it in this order. This is so weird. Uh, our, our mu zero is, yeah, I don't know why sigma that X bar. Mu zero was 200. It was the mean for, from the alternative or from the null hypothesis. Uh, our standard deviation we know is 30 and our X bar was 208. And N is 61, that's good. No, N is 12, sorry, that was the previous problem. It's 12 and not equal to, let's calculate it up. Uh, there we go, we get a P value. Hey, look at that, it's the same one I got. What a surprise. So again, don't reject the null hypothesis. Very, very straightforward. Uh, confidence interval, uh, do Z interval. 
stat, tests, Z interval, uh, that guy. Same data. Or same statistics, I should say. Oh, they're already in here for us. That's very convenient, but we only want a 95% interval. There you go, 191 to 224. Notice that, so my interpretation, I'm 95% confident that St. Bernard, uh, that the average St. Bernard weighs, excuse me, that the population mean uh, weight for all St. Bernards is between 191 and 225 pounds. Notice that 200 falls into that interval. Therefore, we would not, we would expect this to go with a, a conclusion of don't reject or a decision of don't reject the null hypothesis, which we did not. So there you go, doing your, your hypothesis tests with confidence intervals. All right, let's go back to worksheet. I believe that's the last thing. Yes, how does this match up with whether or not you rejected the null hypothesis? It matches up exactly like we'd expect. We found that we, we wouldn't reject the null hypothesis because the mean, uh, the hypothesized mean was in our interval, right? It was in the, the range of reasonable values that we got from our data included 200 pounds. So we don't, we don't think that Jason's friend is necessarily wrong or we don't have enough evidence to suggest that Jason's friend is wrong. So we believe it. There you go. That's the test. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm gonna go ahead and stop it here. That's all I really wanted to say. Uh, test will be next Wednesday. Good luck studying for it. And of course, um, yeah, come uh, come see me in my office hours if you want to uh, if you want to talk about anything. All right, uh, all right. I'm gonna stop it now, and I will see you in the next one.